this is lesson one, the Greek conception of heroism. Now let's start out by moving through the adventures of Theseus. This was a story the Athenians told themselves about how democracy was created. So it's the starting story of the West. It not only explains the origin of a core Western ideal, but in the process it pioneers what James Joyce called the monomyth, and what I would call the Great Western Plot. Theseus' central adventure, confronting the monstrous Minotaur in the labyrinth, became the template for the tales of King Arthur, Luke Skywalker, and Harry Potter. In simplest form, an orphan leaves his homeland, faces an evil force in a strange place, and returns to revive his community with what he's learned or won along the way. Now Theseus is an orphan in the sense that he grows up without a father, but then when he comes of age he receives tokens of his true identity and power. His true father, the king of Athens, placed a sword and a pair of sandals in a cave, sealed with a great stone. When Theseus became a man, he must remove the stone and take what it concealed. Then he could proceed to Athens to claim the king as his father. When his mother finally took him to the stone, he lifted it easily. So this anticipates clearly Arthur pulling Excalibur from the stone, and to Luke finding his father's lightsaber. So then Theseus goes to find his father in Athens. He starts down what Joseph Campbell, the great story theorist, calls the Road of Trials, and on the way he slays all these monsters. He clears the coastal road and makes it safe for law and trade. Iron in his heart, this invincible one who checks the strength of immense opponents. Outrage on outrage always meets its retribution. So let's talk about this retribution. Theseus has a simple but effective idea of justice. What each evildoer had done to others, Theseus did to him. Now that's the idea of proportionality, or the punishment should fit the crime. In the Old Testament, they called it an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But usually, we see this complemented by mercy, which I think is a good look on a hero. Superman or Batman are not cruel and malicious after they defeat someone. They don't grind their foot into the person's throat unnecessarily, torture them for no reason. So I think that the idea of having mercy along with justice makes it go down a little easier. So Theseus finds his father, and then he does something extraordinary. When King Minos of Crete demands his tribute of Athenian children to feed the monster in the maze beneath his palace, Theseus volunteers to go. Now, this is a key move for most Western heroes, going beyond the call of duty, doing more than the minimum, especially to rescue the innocent from a monster. We'll see it in Beowulf in the Dark Ages, and then in the late Middle Ages that proliferates in the tales of King Arthur. Theseus boards the ship bound for Crete, and King Minos himself is aboard. And then, in one of the earliest examples of what the Me Too movement has protested in our own day, this wicked king sexually harasses one of the captive Athenian maidens. He got out of hand with a girl, touched her smooth cheeks. This gives Theseus a chance to show another feature of the Western hero. He speaks truth to power, especially in a situation where he is less powerful than the one he speaks to. The Greeks called this parousia, and the study of this concept was the focus of the last years of the 20th century philosopher Michel Foucault. We'll see parousia also in the Iliad, and we'll see it in the Odyssey, and we'll see it in Socrates, and in many other cases. The Western hero stands up to generals and kings and others in power, and tells them what they need to hear, not only to govern justly, but also to know themselves. Theseus, bronze at the chest, spun dark looks from his brows, and words scored his mind. Son of strictest Zeus, said Theseus to Minos, you no longer steer your reckless force on the lanes of law. Hold your headlong ways. Commander of Crete, rein back your pride. I'd hate to look at the lovely light of immortal morning once you forced a struggling girl. Long before we'll come to grips, and Zeus will guide our course. This idea of trial by combat with God deciding the outcome becomes another key motif in Western hero stories. But in this case, Minos throws a ring overboard and dares Theseus to dive and retrieve it to prove his descent from Poseidon, which Theseus does. Then we have the money scene of this whole Theseus myth, the adventure in the labyrinth, the slaying of the Minotaur, and the escape with Ariadne's thread. The key thing here is that Ariadne and the love story, or what in Hollywood they call the B story, solves the main conflict, the A story. That's a plot trick that's going to recur for the next 2,500 years. Then, having triumphed, Theseus returns to Athens. All versions of the story have him forgetting to rig the white sails, and his father, thinking him dead, jumping off the cliff. And so, in tragedy and irony, his great victorious homecoming turns into this terrible defeat. He loses his father. 
This is also something we notice in a lot of stories, that after you complete the central ordeal, the homecoming can be difficult. When you return to your community, there's always a lot of friction when you're coming back from the special world of the adventure. So look out for that in other stories too, when the hero is returning home. A lot of times as he returns, somebody dies, like Theseus' father does here, and as Ariadne does too in one version of the myth. But in the end, like most Western heroes, Theseus revitalizes his community using his hard-won wisdom. He wants to prevent dictatorship from ruining Athens like it ruined Crete. He wants freedom from the arbitrary abuse of power. So when he succeeds his father as king of Athens, he renounces his kingship and devolves power to the Athenian people. He limits the power of government by inventing democracy. He's forging these laws for a dragon-ridden land. With that, the story proper comes to an end. But the myth was so popular that the Athenians, like Hollywood producers, couldn't resist adding on sequels. Regarding one of these sequels, one of you asked about this Amazon business, where Theseus marries the Amazon queen. Is it consensual? Well, back then, in archaic times, the marriage of a queen, and maybe not just of a queen, had a quality of abduction to it. Theseus defeated the Amazons, and he took their queen with him back to Athens. Now, since he's a demigod and a king, she might have thought, well, this guy's not so bad. I'll ride on the back of his horse to Athens. But her community probably missed her. They said, the Greeks took our queen, so let's invade Greece and try to get her back, which is, I guess, a feminist version of the Trojan War. In the Trojan War, it's the Greeks who fight to rescue their abducted queen, and that's the context of the Iliad, which we'll turn to now. The Iliad is a very important work. It's very difficult work for us to access today. One reason for that is that Homer uses a special language. He doesn't just say the Greeks, he says the Achaeans. He doesn't just say Achilles, he says son of so-and-so. I tried to simplify that language in this reader, but to understand the fascination which the Greeks had with the Trojan War is really difficult for us. The only thing comparable today would be the Bible set in World War II. The Trojan War was the point of reference for their whole culture. Homer's take on the Trojan War tells us what the Greeks thought heroism was. As one of the Greek warriors says, My father sent me off to Troy, I'm proud to say, and I hear his urgings ringing in my ears. Always become the best, my boy, the bravest, and hold your head high above the others. Never disgrace the generation of your fathers. This is a heroism of glory, and of making a name for yourself, which will echo down through eternity. As Hector puts it, Some day someone will say, There's the tomb of one of the brave men whom glorious Hector killed. So they'll say some day, and my fame will never die. And we find this idea of heroism throughout the Iliad. The Odyssey's idea of heroism is a little bit different, and we'll get to that. Let's talk first about the confrontation between Odysseus and Thersites. As the work opens, the invading Greeks have become restless, seeing the war as pointless, and they want to go home. An outspoken, eccentric misfit, Thersites, takes up the cause of peace during an assembly. Odysseus argues against him. He admits that Thersites has truth on his side. The troops have labored long. They're desperate for home. Any fighter cut off from his wife for one month would chafe at the benches, moaning in his ship. A month, but look at us. The ninth year has come round. The ninth we've hung on here. Who could blame the men for chafing, bridling beside the ships? Nevertheless... Because Thersites undermines the war effort by speaking truth, Odysseus calls him insubordinate. How dare you wrangle with kings? You alone? You and your ranting slander. You're the outrage. Then Odysseus beats Thersites down with a stick. And that ends the argument and all dissent. But in the process, this scene launches three recurring themes in Western discourse. One is the problem of political unity, especially in democratic societies where factions can form. Often, especially in crises, leaders find themselves tempted to impose unity through tyranny. Odysseus yields to the tyrannical temptation to silence their cities and keep the Greeks unified, perhaps the earliest instance of what a later age would call cancel culture. Second, like Theseus, Thersites speaks truth to power. Again, this parousia, a less powerful person puts himself at risk to say what must be said. Finally, the episode frames a tension between truth and justice. Everything Thersites says is true, as even Odysseus admits. But if the Greeks heed Thersites and go home, they'll never return Helen to her husband. So a great wrong will remain unrighted. Honoring truth will subvert justice. 
In our own time, in a similar way, discursive norms have narrowed the range of truths that one can publicly avow on many topics to those which one can speak without a perception that one is subverting justice, especially social justice. Now let's talk about the climax of the story, the duel between Achilles and Hector. This is the obligatory scene of the book. Everything leads to it and from it. The two greatest warriors of each side finally meet face to face. Achilles goes into this death match with a special shield made for him by Hephaestus, the god of craft. And the painting on this shield of Achilles depicts the whole Homeric world and everything that's important to the people in it. Earth, sea, and sky, sun and moon and stars, scenes of farming and dancing, one city with a wedding and a law case, another city besieged by an army, work and festival, war and peace. So an object symbolizes the whole world of the epic. We'll see this occur in a lot of epic stories. In a few weeks, we'll see it in Beowulf. Then, when we get to Moby Dick in the second semester, you'll see a painting on the wall of an inn, showing the harpooning of a whale, encapsulating the whole plot of that novel. An epic is so large that, to get a handle on it, a shrewd epic author will make a miniature of the epic and put it in, big and little. Now, on to the duel itself. It might seem like the gods are kind of tricking Hector and that he's not so responsible for what happens to him. But in a way, he is responsible. He does choose based on what he believes. Athena comes and impersonates his brother. And Hector thinks, this is great. I can stand against Achilles because my brother is here with me. He tells Achilles, my spirit stirs me to meet you face to face. Now kill or die. But even though Athena tricks him, Hector causes his own actions in the way he responds to the appearance of Athena. His spirit stirs him as he says. Achilles, too, is represented as personally responsible. He deliberates and chooses between two fates. Homer famously lets us into the mind of Achilles, who tells himself, Two fates bear me on to the day of death. If I voyage back to the home I love, my pride, my glory dies. But the life that's left me will last, and the stroke of death will not come quickly. If, though, I hold out here and lay siege to Troy, I will never make it home, but my glory never dies. Achilles chooses the warrior's way, the short but glorious life. The gods don't impose this choice on him. Now, when Achilles fights Hector, Homer shows us Hector's father watching and goes into a lot of detail about what he's thinking and feeling. Priam moaned, flinging both hands high, beating his head and groaning for his dear son. He groaned and seized his gray hair and tore it out by the root. What do you think it adds to having that perspective? Why did Homer put that in there? I think it makes the scene more emotionally involving. We root for Achilles because he's going to try to avenge his friend Patroclus, whom Hector killed, so he's got a good motive. But on the other hand, we feel for Hector because we see his parents watching him go out to battle, fearing he's going to get killed just for this idea of glory. They love their son and they can't stop it. It's like seeing a car crash in slow motion. Prime's perspective is very well crafted in that sense. I think if anyone wanted to make a career as a writer and was writing a scene in which you were sending someone off to battle to intensify the emotional effect, you could have someone grieve for what might happen to them. I think it's very clever craftsmanship. And this is one of the reasons, the many thousands of reasons, that the Iliad is considered a great book.